pleasure to introduce my uh, old friend, Robert Schiller. He's the Art Oaken Professor of Economics and Professor of Finance at uh, Yale University. Bob received his BA from the University of Michigan in 1967 and his PhD in economics from MIT in 1972. So he's written on financial markets, financial innovation, behavioral economics, macroeconomics, real estate, statistical methods, and on public attitudes, uh, opinions, and moral judgments regarding markets. So today he's going to talk about his book, uh, Subprime Solution, how the global financial crisis happened and what to do about it. This was published in September of 2008, so you couldn't ask for better timing. Uh, it's available on Amazon's Kindle, and as we discovered at lunch, it's also partially available on Google Books. Uh, his repeat sales home price indices, developed originally with Carl Case, are published as a Standard Poor's Case Schiller home price indices, and the Chicago Merck now maintains a futures market based on those indices. So if you want to read more about Bob, you can go to his homepage at robertschiller.com. But now, uh, let's welcome Bob to Google. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. So I've written a book, uh, Subprime Solution, which appeared uh, September 1. And I guess I should maybe be considering myself lucky on the timing, or maybe not so lucky, because the world has moved so much since September 1 uh, that uh, um, there's so much that's not in my book. So I'm going to present for the first part of my talk an update of my book <laughs> about what's been happening. Um, since uh, since the, book, the book, when I wrote the book, it was about a subprime crisis and about a financial crisis. But now it's looking more like the issue is whether we're having another depression or not, at least in uh, estimation of a lot of people. Uh, since I published the book, the U.S. government has nationalized major financial institutions, has put short sale constraints to try to prop up the stock market. Uh, they've compromised our basic capitalist institutions in an effort to deal with this crisis, which seems to be getting more and more severe. Uh, but uh, also, since I've written a book, a subprime solution is about what to do about this crisis. I've discovered that I am the destination for everyone's idea. My email inbox <laughs> uh, is a treasure trove of ideas. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's kind of mind-boggling the number of ideas that are being uh, thrown out now to deal with this crisis. Uh, but uh, I'm going to stick with some of the ideas in my book, which I think are, uh, I guess what sets mine apart from a lot of others is that I'm uh, concerned with the, the longer run consequences. But one uh, perspective that I'm trying to keep in mind is that these economic crises that reach the severity of the present one uh, tend to be long lived and have consequences that extend over years. So I think there's a little bit too much of a sense of urgency to patching the holes in the sinking ship we should be more thinking about this as an opportunity to amend our, our eco economy so that it works better. And maybe it's because I'm trained in finance. Uh, I believe in financial theory and that uh, that's a technology that, that we have to adapt. Uh, and actually the crisis ought to be considered a, a failure to apply risk management theory. Uh, so that makes me... Um, makes my proposals look kind of odd, um, which I'll come to in a minute. Be proposals that, uh, that uh, seem more like, let's develop a better system, uh, a better economic system that uh, accords with our abstract theory better. Another perspective that you'll see prominent in my talk is uh, behavioral economics. Uh, I've been involved in that for some years. Uh, and. Uh, my colleague Richard Thaler uh, and I have had a behavioral finance workshop at the National Bureau of Economic Research for, uh, we started that in 1991. And uh, George Akerlof and I have a behavioral macroeconomics uh, workshop uh, almost as long. So I, uh, I'm really of the belief that we have to think about human psychology in trying to understand the kind of events we've been going through. Um, 
So I think that the Great Depression, I'm going to talk about the Great Depression. I, I do it with less compunction than I did two months ago. I used to think I was being alarmist in talking about that, and I had some hesitation. In fact, uh, I had some of my business colleagues said, don't use that D word again. They <laughs> said, I'm being too negative. Uh, but now that everyone else is using it, I can uh, relax and just, uh, I'm not saying that we're going to have another Great Depression, but I am going to say that the Great Depression was an interesting event uh, that we have a lot of parallels to. And we have to make sure that we respond in a good way so that we have a, a better outcome than we did that time. Uh, now anyway, I wanted to start, though, by just, uh, uh, well, first of all, I should say I, I also have a company, Macro Markets, um, and the lawyers gave me this to put on my slide. <laughs> uh, th this is the only slide that I didn't write. Uh, so, uh, uh, and what this is saying, I'll, I'll, I'll say this and I'll paraphrase this. First of all, don't believe a word that I say, okay? <laughs> and, and, and don't base any investment decisions on what I say. And Always read the prospectus, okay, and get a financial advisor, okay. So um, that's all good advice, uh, I guess. So I wanted to start with the um, I, the history of the U.S. stock market, uh, and this is a history that uh, goes back from 1871 until yesterday. I apologize, I, I don't have today. I like to be up to date, but I just got in on an airplane and I, I didn't get it. What has it done today? Anyone know? Up or down? It's up. All right. We might have broken up above the minus. It was minus 50.2% uh, from the peak. Uh, so that up there is the peak of the stock market. This, the blue line is real inflation corrected price. And almost nobody inflation corrects stock price indices, but I do because I'm an economist and I I know that the monetary standard is like a measurement ruler that's changing through time, so I do a CPI correction. So if you do the CPI correction, yesterday we were down 50% from the peak. Uh, it was 54% the day before, or a couple days before, uh, so it's oscillating around. But you can see that we've had a major contract contraction in the stock market since 2000. Related uh, and this is a... Uh, a, a, a Obviously, by historical perspective, this is a very unusual event. Um, the only other example like it is this one right here. This is the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. Um, it looks smaller here because I didn't do this on a log scale, but you can see that it, proportionally, it's the run-up in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, is similar to the run-up in the Roaring Nineties. Uh, the decline, we've, we're down 50%. Here, it went down 80%. Uh, so, quite a substantially. We're, we're like right around 1931 here, right now. <laughs> it looks almost identical. <laughs> well, or maybe we're more like uh, here. I, at that time, th there was the, the market bottomed out in 32 and it shot up in 37, uh, and then it it kind of oscillated down. So we've had this, you know, the two peaks. Well, I'm making too much of similarities. The, the, the really important thing, because I know I have a lot of econometricians, at least uh, Hal's team was. One thing you know as an econometrician is that it's pretty hard to do a conclusive theory of events like this that happened only twice in 130 years. I mean, and, and you, you would try to build a model that says all these little wiggles somehow add up to this. Uh, but that's not always the same thing as trying to understand these big events, which I think have a huge cultural and psychological component. And I'm trying to interpret them and try to understand them uh, I wrote a book called Irrational Exuberance that tried to do that, and I think you have to use uh, a lot of different methods to get at what happened here. I think both of these were bubbles. This is a bubble, and this is a bubble. Uh, and uh, what is a bubble? It's a it's kind of a social epidemic. It's a feedback uh, loop. Uh, as people see prices rising, they get excited. They, they hear stories of other people making a lot of money, and they get envious. It becomes uh, all-consuming. Everyone's talking about it. People want to get into it because it's the thing that's happening. Uh, and that so more and more people come piling into the market, and price keeps going up. But it, it's unsustainable. Uh, 
because when it reaches a certain, but it can't keep going up forever, and eventually everyone thinks they're rich, and there's something wrong because they aren't really rich, uh, only the price has gone up. So the bubble corrects. It usually mystifies people. Uh, as to what happened uh, on October 1929, there's no good answer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there's no good answer. It, it was some endogenous collapse in the market. And the same thing for 2000. Uh, what about 1973? 1973, it's right there. 73, 74. Yeah, that was the next biggest drop, I think. It went down in real terms, 40 percent, yeah. Um, all right, maybe there's three, <laughs> okay, in 130 years. Um, but uh, this is the price-earnings ratio. Uh, now, I, I'm using uh, a version of the price-earnings ratio that Benjamin Graham and David Dodd recommended in their 1934 book, Securities Analysis. They said most of the time they divide price by the last year's earnings or some or, or variations on that. But Graham and Dodd said you should divide it by a long average of earnings because year-to-year -year earnings are too volatile and it's not a good measure of fundamental value. So I'm doing what they said. Uh, not many people do this. I took price divided by 10-year average, real price divided by 10-year average of real earnings. Uh, and you can see that there have been two peaks in the price earnings ratio in 1929 uh, and then an even higher one in 2000. This is the dot-com bubble, the internet bubble uh, that uh, I think had uh, psychological. I, I say psychological. I don't mean that people went crazy. I mean that, uh, that uh, you have to read a lot of different things that psychologists say to try to understand it. There was a, um, a social contagion. I'll come back to this, but the uh, important thing is it's not really explained by interest rates. These are just uh, long-term interest rates. Uh, you might think there'd be a negative relation. Well, there does in some times, but not in other times. So there's no simple explanation in, in those terms. Um, so this is a plot of the volatility of the stock market for every day since uh, January 13, 1928. Uh, what I did for every day is I took the preceding 30 days of stock price changes using the S&P index, uh, and I took the standard deviation of them, all right? So it's just uh, v variance, uh, stand square root of variance of, of stock price. Am I blocking your view? Sorry if I... Uh, you can see what's happened just now. Uh, this, this is uh, um, uh, yesterday. <laughs> We've seen a huge increase in volatility. Uh, and so let's, let's put that in historical perspective. There's this spike here. That was uh, 1987. That was because uh, the, uh, the S&P index dropped 20% in one day. Uh, and that was the biggest one-day drop ever. It's, it's mostly due to that. It seemed to be an isolated event. Maybe it was partly uh, related to the so-called program trading, uh, portfolio insurance trading <coughs> schemes that were <coughs> prominent then. But if you exclude that event, to get a, a volatility this high, you have to go all the way back to 1929. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Uh, but also, the other interesting thing is that for the Great Depression, which went from 29 to 41, the market was very volatile for that whole period. So here we have another spike up, which compares to the 29 spike up. I'm kind of wondering where we'll go from here. Um, uh, the suspicion is that we're going to be going through a very volatile period. Uh, and I have a psychological model of that. Uh, and which is that uh, it has to do with attention that psychologists talk a lot about. Attention is a very basic function of human intelligence. We have to know when to pay attention to one thing and when not to. Uh, and uh, a lot of the most important errors that people make are errors of attention. I guess you people make search engines, right? So you're, maybe you're solving that problem for us, but uh, changing the way it works. But somehow, we're capricious in what we pay attention to. Uh, and I believe that uh, what's happened recently is there's a climax of attention. So that what's happening right now and what was happening in these periods is people have started to think that I really have to worry about stock market investments because um, everything is happening. You have a lot of people who are thinking, 
I better, you know, I've been thinking about adjusting my portfolio for two years now, and I never did anything. I was too busy with other things. And now suddenly, you hear all these things happening, and everyone's talking about it. So you get right to it, and you make decisions more quickly. So time is kind of sped up now, and it, re it reveals this um, great spike in volatility. Uh, so um, this is consumer confidence measured by the conference board. Uh, another parallel, well, nobody did confidence indexes in the Great Depression, so I won't make that parallel exact, except that the impression is that people lost confidence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. But um, we're now at the lowest level uh, in the whole history of the conference. Con this only shows it back to 1990, but it goes back to 1967, uh, and it's never been this low. Uh, that doesn't mean that the stock market isn't going to have big up days, by the way. It, it, and, and I also think the stock market is very hard to predict, and I'm not giving a, uh, a prediction here. Um, this is another example showing you how unusual the present time really is. This is the um, three-month uh, interest rate, the Treasury bill rate, government-issued uh, uh, government um, um, securities, which are thought to be the lowest risk least likely to default of any uh, security. Um, the interesting thing is, I stopped this chart on September 17 when it hit zero. Oops. <laughs> uh, uh, that's zero. Actually, it got negative uh, briefly. Uh, and so you, you can see that it never happened. Uh, this series starts in January 4, 1951. I've got every single day, and it's never done it before. Uh, so I, I asked my students in class, how can it be that you have a negative interest rate? Because wouldn't you just like to hold cash? You, you know, you get an interest rate of zero. And I, I asked my students, maybe, can you explain, how can we get a negative interest rate? You, you, how, some people, you can't, there can't have enough space to store all your cash. Right, that's, that's what it is. I mean, that's the thing. If, if you've got, uh, you could ask for suitcases full of $100 bills, right, if, you're, if you've got a lot of money. But you're probably not going to do that, right? You'll take a slightly negative interest rate. Um, it was only very briefly. But the, the point is that this phenomenon here reflects a lack of confidence, that people were wanted to put their money in the safest asset, even if it was, uh, had a negative return. When was the last time that happened? I know when it was. It was in 1938 in the Great Depression. And I found newspaper searching <laughs> on newspaper articles from 38 explaining how it can be that people will invest at a negative interest rate. It hasn't happened again until just now. Uh, yeah? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're at negative interest rates for a while. I think so, yeah, that's right. It, it basically comes down to some sort of convenience thing because you don't want to be putting suitcases of money under your bed. And an account isn't safe either, right? And so what are you going to do, right? Uh, uh, but this is, shows, this is evidence of a, of a, a stunning loss of confidence. Uh, I just wanted to show another country as an example. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that this is not a uniquely U.S. thing. So this is just the um, real Shanghai Composite Stock Price Index. It's a renminbi index, so I uh, converted it using a Chinese Consumer Price Index to a real index. And you can see what's been happening in China, the stock market was uh, just, uh, you know, drifting along here. Uh, and then around 2006, it went up fivefold. Uh, and then, bang! Just look at that. You know, we, we teach our students about random walks. Uh, and I think, <laughs> I, well, this could happen. A random walk could do this. Uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I, I don't want to be quick to dismiss anything any theory, but it seems like uh, it's probably useful to think about some psychological cause. I, that's my inference for this kind of event. And when it's happening in many different countries around the world at the same time, uh, I'm concluding it has something to do with global culture. I want to move to the uh, housing market. Uh, when I did the second edition of my book, Irrational Exuberance, I created a uh, home price index uh, going back to 1890. Again, I have this thing about wanting long-term perspective. Um, and uh, 
I had to piece together various indices. The red line is the home price index. Uh, and the remarkable thing here is that uh, there was no trend to home prices. These are real prices of a standard home uh, for the United States uh, in major cities. Uh, and uh, until recently, and then we had a near doubling of home prices. Now, you might look at this, especially since I'm standing here in California. You have an <coughs> unusual perspective on home prices here. Uh, California is the bubbliest state uh, in the world, in the US, anyway. Um, in fact, um, the, uh, there was a huge home price bubble in Los Angeles, Southern California, in the 1880s, uh, uh, which they were worrying might extend up to San Francisco, but it never reached that far north. But uh, you might ask, how can they have a home price bubble? That's in the days of cowboys and Indians, isn't it? And how could they have thought that uh, housing was getting scarce? Uh, but they did, and it happened, and it burst. And there's a, a remarkable um, article I found in the Los Angeles Times from 1886 saying, we've learned our lesson. Never again <laughs> will we launch on such a wild speculation. Um, but, but we've done it again. So there, there was a bubble in California in the 70s and in the 80s, but they don't show up so big on this chart because uh, it, was, it was more localized. But what's happening now is it's so much of the country. By the way, these are not explained uh, by uh, uh, just looking at, I mean, this is a huge increase suddenly, recently, uh, and it's not explained by these, not obviously explained by building costs, population, or interest rates. Uh, and that's why I keep coming back to thinking it's a, a uh, social phenomenon. Uh, and, and what caused it to turn around? That's also not so obvious. But again, I, I think that the, the, it's part of feedback. You know, uh, mathematicians who study feedback say that it has a, can have a very complicated dynamic. It has its own dynamics. And uh, um, y uh, it doesn't necessarily trace back to something that Alan Greenspan did. Uh, of course, that's when he resigned. He, he picked the perfect date to resign, 2006, <laughs> right, right at the peak. Um, this is just showing a number of cities. Um, and uh, this is kind of hard to read. This is, I can't even read this. This is distorted here. I think this is San Francisco, right? Um, and so anyway, you can see that the, there's a similar pattern in many different cities. It's attenuated in some. Denver is showing less than others. Uh, uh, so uh, it's also, uh, uh, the, these are the S&P Case-Shiller price indexes that Carl Case and I developed and are now, you can find them, uh, they're free on the Standard & Poor website. Uh, the, uh, this shows the uh, prices uh, for low, middle, and high-priced homes. Uh, and uh, I haven't mentioned the subprime uh, revolution yet, but subprime loans are loans to uh, borrowers who normally wouldn't qualify for a loan because of a poor credit or no job or something like that. Uh, and one thing that has happened starting in the 1990s and accelerating in the 2000s is that we have more and more institutions that lend to subprime borrowers uh, and uh, they have been poorly regulated. So some of them are predatory. They seem to be giving loans to people that uh, didn't have a good prospect. And then selling off the loans uh, to uh, securitizers who would then put them in your retirement portfolio <laughs> as the other side. Um, so something, some mistakes were made. But it's interesting to see <laughs> that, um, that subprime loans, that, that low-priced homes showed a higher rate of increase than um, than did uh, higher uh, than higher priced homes. So it's it, it's kind of a contrary. It's not a McMansion bubble as much as it is a um, a, a small uh, two bedroom home bubble. Uh, and that's why it's involving so there's so much suffering going on now with with this collapse in the market. Uh, defaults uh, are affecting a lot of lower income people. This is Boston, but it's similar. I I, I should have put. San Francisco up, but I didn't think of it. But it's the same. It looks much the same here. Um, it's also a, a world uh, phenomenon, I think, because it uh, 
this is London, England. Uh, and again, that's the real, that's the real Halifax, uh, Greater London Home Price Index. Uh, and I superimposed it on Boston. And uh, to me, it's kind of interesting to see how similar the two are. Uh, and w why is that? Uh, uh, I think it's because of world culture. Uh, we're all interconnected. Uh, you people here at Google are part of the reason <laughs> why we're so in interconnected, but uh, the uh, barriers to uh, information flow across countries are changing, are, are declining. And so uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's the, the bubble enthusiasm that developed in this period or this period uh, it is palpably similar in lots of countries. I was just uh, uh, in March, I was in Moscow. And so I'm very alert to bubble stories and bubble thinking. And uh, I tried to get people to tell me those. So I, was, I had a limo driver who spoke English, and he was driving me past Red Square. And I just prodded him just a little bit to tell me some real estate stories. <laughs> and so he said, see that building there? On, it's right on Red Square. And you get a view of St. Basil's Cathedral and the Kremlin. He said, what do you think an apartment sold for there recently? And he said it was $100,000 per square meter. Um, and he says, I don't know how anyone can afford that. If some Arab, a rich Arab uh, oil uh, sheik or someone. Uh, and, and then another man told me a story about his daughter who bought uh, land outside of Moscow 10 years ago. And he said, I told her you're paying way too much. But now it's worth 10 times more. So those, that, that's, the, that's the feeling of a bubble. And it, it uh, happens uh, elsewhere as well, including Moscow. Uh, and they seem to be correcting down in a lot of places. So the, uh, the theme of my talk is that I think bubbles are caused by, uh, I have a theory of bubbles that uh, it, it's kind of a complex social phenomenon. There has to be something that gets it started. So we have precipitating factors first. And what I mean by that is there's something that gets the bubble going. Uh, and I'd have a list of many, many things that did it. But uh, let me just mention the, um, the sense. Uh, one, in, in my 2000 book, I talked about the uh, arrival of the internet as a precipitating factor for the stock market bubble because um, it created a sense of of uh, opportunity. A lot of the bubble was the dot-com stocks. It created a sense of a new era that was coming. And now that sounds kind of silly. Why should a sense of those events have such a big impact on the market? But remember, we're talking behavioral economics and not <laughs> rational economics. Um, so uh, the internet was a very visible thing, not just to you people, but to anyone. Compared to any other technology, it was right there on your desk, and it was something that you interacted with. And you could easily imagine that it was a powerful change in our society. What, what tends to happen then is it becomes interwoven as part of a story of, uh, of a bubble. So the amplification mechanism is a feedback where, uh, that, is, uh, that causes the prices to feed back into more price increases and to also amplify stories that justify the bubble. Now, cultural factors refers to the news media that amplify the stories uh, and uh, uh, form a story about the bubble. And psychological factors refers to a lot of biases like overconfidence that get involved. So this is the problem that we saw a, a succession of bubbles, uh, the, the stock price bubble uh, in the 90s, and then following on a, a real estate bubble. Uh, now, you, it's still, I don't think we have any clear idea why a real estate bubble followed the stock price bubble. Um, but it seems to have something to do, I've done, been doing questionnaire surveys of people and trying to understand it. It partly has to do, I think, with an investing culture that developed during the 90s stock market and a sense that people, of people's personal identity as investors and a sense that... Uh, well, the stock market didn't do so well, but there has to be some other investment. Um, uh, um, but may maybe I'm not uh, being very convincing about why we had a second bubble, but uh, maybe these things are not so easy to understand. It's, it's a little bit like an epidemic. Why do we have uh, epidemics from time to time? It's because something affects the contagion rate of a disease. 
And if the contagion rate rises sufficiently above the removal rate, it explodes into an epidemic. Same thing happens culturally. So some ideas developed. Notably, an idea developed that home prices, that homes are a wonderful investment, that the price only goes up, never goes down. And that seemed to be taken for granted by many people. Uh, so this then brings me to, I'm going to leave time for questions. I, I, hope, I hope they generate some <laughs> ideas. Uh, I want to talk about what we should do about this uh, problem. So, uh, and I'm going to start with short run solutions. But uh, in the short run, uh, we are in a mess, I think. And uh, uh, what we have done, I think largely because of our complacency generated by these bubbles, we put people in a situation where um, they managed risk terribly. Uh, let's start with individual homeowners. It became enlightened wisdom that most people should put their life savings into an investment in real estate in one city, okay, and leverage it up 90% or more. Now, if you did that in the stock market, if you told your friends, I'm going to buy uh, one company's stock and I'm going to margin it, you can't even do it, it's not even legal to margin it up 90%. That's the legacy of the Great Depression when they said, we won't let anyone do that anymore. But say, you know, you say, I've got a way to margin it up 90%, and I'm going to do that. And it's only one company. People would say you're crazy. But in fact, that's what we're telling everyone to do with their homes. Uh, and I think that w w in trying to understand why that became conventional wisdom is uh, it's a bit baffling. But uh, it, it again re refers to big errors that people make, largely through inattention. They just take it for granted that some things are true, and they're, they're not investigating. And that's my view of it. So, yeah. There is a difference between a living house. You're saying a difference between a house and a stock is you can live in it. Right. Uh, so what? <laughs> I mean, uh, it doesn't mean it's a good investment. Um, I, you know, again, I'm trained. I don't know how much uh, many of you have had finance courses, but if you take an elementary course in financial theory, there is no such thing as the best investment. If you look at optimal portfolio theory, you want to diversify and spread over everything. Uh, and uh, what, what, what the theory would suggest is that you should rent whatever house or apartment you'd like and then diversify as broadly as possible. I mean, that, well, that's defined. There's a theory of how to define what it means to def uh, but uh, people don't understand that. that uh, there's maybe many issues here, but I, I think we have to get down to the fact. Let me, let me, maybe we'll have more questions later. But basically, I think that individual homeowners are the most, the people to be most concerned about. We're getting foreclosures of 10,000 a day. Uh, and these people were following what they thought was good advice. Uh, and they weren't, uh, uh, it's not really their fault. Uh, that we're in this mess. It's a messy situation, though, because uh, everything, anything you do to bail someone else out hurts someone else. But I think that we have a civil society, and some of this has to be done. Uh, but I'm not so fond of my short-run solutions. I, I actually, in, in my book, recommended that we create another homeowner's loan corporation. Uh, and other people have taken up many different variations on that idea. Uh, and, you know, Congress created a, a, a $300 billion bailout, bailout plan in, uh, at the end of July. So that may not be enough. But this isn't very exciting to me. I want to think about how we got in this mess and how to try to fix it. Uh, so I have long-run solutions in the book that I have three parts. One is a new information infrastructure, which is this slide. Then I've got broader markets, which is coming up. And then finally, better retail products. And so I think that we should take this as an opportunity. Given that this crisis might last for many years, and given that there's going to be more in the future, we should start thinking long term. I think that's what people did in the Great Depression. I, and that, this may be my last Great Depression parallel. <laughs> but in the Great Depression, in the 32 election, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt promised a new deal. Uh, and he promised to, uh, 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 well, he promised some big changes were coming that would benefit the common man. 
uh, and uh, his opponent, Herbert Hoover, criticized Roosevelt for not making it at all clear. What were these big changes anyway? And Roosevelt wouldn't say during the election. But after Roosevelt got elected, he made some really big changes. Notably, he dropped us off the gold standard within one week of being president. The, that was a pretty major change. It scared a lot of people. And he created the FDIC, the Deposit Insurance, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I mentioned the Homeowners Loan Corporation, whose successor was Fannie Mae. Uh, all these things are still with us. So that's what I want to think about is what can we do now that would resemble Roosevelt's 100 days uh, when he set up so many different things. Uh, so, uh, and these are more long term and they might not seem to be immediately addressing the crisis, but I think they do in a more fundamental sense. Uh, so I, I think that we need better information, uh, that people were doing things that were demonstrably not optimal and because they didn't know. And I'll just mention the first of these here, the top one, the comprehensive financial advice. I think that the general public in the United States is unfortunately ignorant about finance and about risk management uh, and the kind of advice that would be routinely understood by people in a finance department or an insurance department just isn't getting out. Uh, and so uh, the proposal is that we subsidize financial advice. Of course, you know, I might add, we already do subsidize financial advice because it's tax deductible uh, on your income tax. But that doesn't help low-income people because you can only deduct it if it exceeds 2% 2 of your adjusted gross income and you itemize. And so that just excludes everybody. Um, only the rich <laughs> would actually deduct financial advice. So I think we should have some other system that subsidizes it uh, for everyone. And what I'd like to see is the financial advisors who promise that they will not accept commissions or kickbacks they're not selling any product would get the uh, subsidy. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit like moving the finance profession towards the medical profession. Think about what you have today when you, when you buy or so let's say you buy or sell a house. You talk to a realtor. The realtor is not your long-term relation, someone who's coming to try to get the sale done as fast as possible and has incentives. Not the, you know, they're probably not going to tell you, are you sure you should be buying a house now? <laughs> Simple advice like that won't come from a realtor unless they're exceptionally, people have exceptional integrity. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a little bit like imagine that the medical system ha w w was um, that when you get sick, you, know, you go to the drug company and you talk to a salesman who will <laughs> try to sell you on one of their drugs. That's not the way the medical system should work, but that's the way our finance system uh, works. Um, secondly, I think we need better markets to manage, and this has been a campaign of mine for some years. I, uh, I, I think I talked about this the last time I was at Google. <laughs> well, I'll talk about it again because uh, good ideas uh, stay good ideas. <laughs> and they haven't happened yet, at least not as much as I'd like. Um, so I think that the, the, the crisis is a failure to manage real estate risk. Uh, and there's other kinds of risks that might be met. I'm just going to talk about real estate risk. So uh, Hal was saying that um, we created futures markets for single-family homes. And this is uh, a plot. We did create that in, in March of 2000, uh, I'm sorry, May of 2006. So we now have traded, trading at the Chicago Merck uh, futures contracts for 10 U.S. cities as well as an aggregate. Uh, and this is, the, unfortunately, these markets are not, very liquid. Uh, we have to uh, we have to somehow uh, subsidize these. Or how do you get someone to put more capital into these markets so that we'll have a better market-making facility? But right now we do have them. And I have to explain what this is for any of these cities. Uh, maybe I should show. Uh, I have east. Maybe I should go to west since we're in the west. Uh, and. Um, uh, it's hard to read these somehow. San Francisco is the green line. Um, so suppose you uh, want to hedge your house uh, here uh, in the, in the uh, general Bay Area. How far are we from the Bay Area, from San Francisco? We are. So, okay, this is you then, the green line. <laughs> All right. So you can get on. I'm not uh, selling you anything, but I'd, I'd just like to make this real. You can get on the CME website and, and find a, a broker, uh, and then you can sell uh, futures. 
to protect your investment in your home. So um, basically, uh, if you sell San Francisco futures, unfortunately, if you went on a two-year contract, it's, it's predicting a decline over the next two years of, what is that, like minus, it looks like 16, 17%. Uh, so the, what happens if you did this thing? You can't protect yourself against the. Does that look like 17? Let's say it's 17 percent decline. You can't protect yourself against the 17 percent decline because it's in the market. You can only protect yourself against more than a 17. The market already expects you to lose another 17 percent. Uh, and so, but if you sell, what this does for you then is if home prices fall by more than 17%, you'll get that back, okay? So it protects you. But if, it's, uh, if they fall by less than 17%, you pay. In other words, you can lock in 17% loss. This is part of the problem, the psychological problem <laughs> that we're having. But it's actually, uh, well, okay, I, mean, I made that very poignantly, didn't I? <laughs> but, uh, anyway, can I get a show of hands? Who would like to loss, lock in a 17% loss? Um, but see, the, see, this is the problem about getting markets started. If you really, no one knows about these markets. If you knew about these markets and people talked about them more, it would start to seem real, and you would start to think differently. See, there's kind of a, the, the, the psychology is still, uh, what happens in a down market in real estate is that people keep holding on to this dream that my home is really worth more, and, uh, uh, and so the, the volume of sales goes down, and, and they won't face reality. This, I believe, is, is reality. At least this is what the market says. What's the x-axis? The x oh, these, these are the, con uh, the dates of the contracts. That we're showing every year. So this is uh, the spot today. It's at 0%. Right. That's the 0% the decline for today. That's just a construct. This is November of 08. And these are the prices. So it's predicting a minus 5%. I'm sorry. This is... November of... That's supposed to be October, or these... Oh, this is 5% decline from the last data, which was uh, September. Yeah, so it's another 5% decline by November, which we're already past September. This is not entirely um, updated. Uh, and then uh, November 09 would be another contract. And you can pick whichever contract you want. Uh, depending on what your horizon is. Um, so, but, but I, I guess y you agree with me about the problem. Uh, if, we, if people were thinking about these, it would, if, if we could get these going on a bigger scale where people are talking about them, it would tend to rationalize the whole market. First of all, it would internationalize them. And uh, one thing I, I've, I've, I hate to say, I think Californians are a little... <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> <There> are, uh, <laughs> uh, when I was in Turkey, I was, I was at a beautiful resort. This is in my book, the story of my book. Uh, I was in a beautiful resort called Ozdir, and uh, it was on the Aegean Sea. And off the co we were on this outdoor, having a meal. And there was a beautiful view to the island of Samos. And someone told me that's where Pythagoras lived and where Aristarchus lived in ancient times. Anyway, it was a beautiful scene. And so I started talking to them about bubbles in real estate. And I said, you know, I, I, I come from the U.S., and there's this place called California where um, people there are always telling me that everybody wants to live here because it's such a beautiful place. So I, I asked for a show of hands. How many of you would really rather live in California? And nobody raised their hand. Um, <laughs> it, the point is, there are some really beautiful places in Turkey Okay, and the Turks, are you from Turkey? Yeah. Am I right? Uh, and the Turks, <laughs> what's that? Why is he here? I'm being, I'm being really, <laughs> anyway, so the Turks know about them, right? And so they're not going to, uh, they'll have an offsetting skepticism about any California bubble. And they're, in an idealized world, they'll come in and short California. <laughs> It'll prevent the bubble from ever happening. Um, anyway, so enough on that. I, I just want to, we're also, we had a theory that the futures markets may not be working because most people don't trade in futures. Uh, and in fact, uh, futures are difficult to trade. I wasn't giving you investment advice. I was telling you you could do this. Uh, not only would you have to accept 
a 17% loss on your house <laughs> going forward. But you would also um, have to deal with margin calls. The broker would call you up and say, nope, you lost money again, so you got to put up more margin or I'll close you out. Um, people don't like that. So we had the idea that we wanted to create um, asset uh, uh, shares, uh, stock exchange traded, um, uh, either to take a long or short position in homes. And so I can't, uh, we've just registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission and we're planning to create these in um, uh, later this year. But I, I can't talk about them uh, because we're in registration. But uh, I think that we want to develop, but the point of this is we want to develop markets for risks that matter. And I can see that the people here are not psyched for it yet. Uh, for <laughs> I didn't get a, a roaring uh, a response to my suggestion that you lock in a 17% decline on your home price. But ultimately, if we did that, it would make a system that, that this whole crisis is about a failure to manage real estate risk. And it, it, it seems like you have this impression that the financial world is so sophisticated. Maybe you do. And it is in certain dimensions, but in other dimensions it's not at all. And that's where the problems come in. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, now that's the other side. If you, uh, well, this is, uh, yeah, uh, you, so you, you don't have a house yet, I assume, let's say for hypothetically. Uh, and so um, uh, the market is saying that you should maybe wait a couple of years, right, because it'll be 17% cheaper. That's what this market is saying. Uh, but, um, but you don't know that. It might be that this is wrong. Uh, and you, you, uh, so you are going to wait two years, but hey, it could be that the market is wrong and prices could be on another boom, right? So what you would do then is buy on the futures market uh, to, if you think you're going to, and you can lock in the 17% decline now. In fact, yeah, so that's the other side. We have to do both sides. The futures market needs both sides to clear. Uh, so... Um, Anyway, I'm going to just talk about the last thing. and I'm out of time, basically. This is my concluding uh, idea, long-run solutions. Uh, but it's also motivated by the idea of risk management, of making risk management work. The system, I'm going to talk just about the first item here, the continuous workout mortgage. That's a term that I coined for the book. Mortgages uh, today, are uh, they don't have built-in flexibility for responding to economic crises like the one we're in now. So people today uh, in an economic crisis, which uh, may be getting worse, there'll be unemployment rising, there'll be uh, people with uh, compromised balance sheets in various ways. These people find it difficult to pay their mortgage and they go, what do they do? They, they go to, the they, they, first thing they do is they don't pay, okay? Then they start getting uh, calls from collection agencies Eventually, people say, you know, you should go to the mortgage lender and just lay it out. You know, you can't do it. Often this happens also at times of some kind of family stress, an illness or something bad happens. So you go and you tell your sob story to the mortgage lender. And the, the mortgage lender will ask you to fill out an application for a workout. And then uh, you'll go home and wait and hope. And maybe they'll give you uh, a workout, which means they'll lower your mortgage balance. They do this in their own self-interest because they go back and think, well, this guy's not going to pay anyway, and it's going to cost us a lot to evict this guy, and he'll wreck the house, and he'll be mad, and the neighbors will be upset, and we'll have all sorts of problems. So why don't we just give the guy a break? That's a workout. Unfortunately, we're having trouble doing these workouts because we didn't expect this huge crisis, and the mortgage... Uh, uh, mortgages have been sold and resold into securitized packages that are held all over the world. So the mortgage servicer is afraid to do these workouts because uh, the servicer thinks that he or she might get sued for doing a workout that doesn't have the authority. And who has the authority? Well, it's all dispersed around the world by different investors who might be angry about uh, so their giving workouts. So it's all stopped up and it doesn't seem to work. So my proposal is that mortgages should have a workout built in to the original contract, and it should be priced in. This is a private sector advance in mortgage technology. So mortgages should 
automatically and continuously adjust payments to home prices and to uh, uh, other indicators of economic distress. And so uh, it wouldn't, this fixes a lot. And also I think it could be based on indexes like home price indexes or um, national income indexes or unemployment rate, things like that, which uh, means that the mortgage has less of a moral hazard problem uh, f for people. Right now there's a moral hazard problem that people go and pretend that they can't pay thinking that maybe they'll get a workout. It also has a moral dilemma that some people don't believe in defaulting on a contract they sign, so they, they try hard to pay. And somebody else who has no compunction gets a workout. So why should it be that way? I think it should be systematic. So it should be built in at the beginning. And then if it is built in, they can still securitize them, but the, secure, it's, the system is all worked out ahead of workouts. Everyone thinks workouts are good. Our president thinks they're good. Paulson thinks they're good. Congress thinks they're good. But we just can't seem to do them. And so this is a bit of uh, advance in our mortgage technology. Uh, so anyway, the final, oh, this is what I just said. I forgot I had that slide. Finally, uh, uh, I just wanted to say that what, what I'm saying about finance is largely uh, I'm talking about the democratization of finance, moving, uh, getting better advice for people, getting financial markets that deal with risks like home prices, and getting mortgages that deal with risks to homeowners. Those are all examples of making uh, uh, finance uh, serve the people. I call that, I, have a, I just created this website now, financialdemocracy.org, with information about this topic. So um, I, I'm done, and uh, do we have any other yeah. thoughts? I got, I got a question. Um, so when I hear um, you talk about the bubbles, it sounded like there was nothing that uh, uh, could have been done about it. So, and um, to me, bubbles are like clear, like policy errors. So, um, es especially when they're that quickly, when they happen that quickly. So, um, um, I'm, and I'm just uh, trying to find out what your opinion is. If um, Greenspan wouldn't, um, would have included like housing and everything in, in the mm -hmm. inflation index, then maybe people would have seen that, uh, even the, I mean, the Fed right. didn't even know that, uh, uh, that, that, that there's a bubble apparently. So it's not only the people, it's the, it's, it's the Fed also. Um, right. So if he would have known, or if he would have maybe listened to some other people more, um, and he would have jacked up interest rates a little more, right. wouldn't, wouldn't that have been the appropriate response at the right. time? And right. so that's just uh, what you're right. taking Right. Well, part is. of what uh, was Gr Greenspan's problem was that we've had uh, an, a revolution in finance called efficient markets, which has dominated academic finance for 30 years or more. Uh, and it says that markets are, are uh, smarter than any individual. And you'd hear Greenspan say that. Uh, I think uh, there's some partial truth to that in describing financial markets, but much less true when you're talking about the housing market. Uh, and Greenspan apparently didn't want to challenge these things. So as a result, uh, from 2002 to 2005, he had negative real federal funds rate. Um, it was a long period of exceptionally loose monetary policy right during the peak of the bubble. And I think that that is part of the story of the bubble. And so he could have done something about it. Uh, I don't know that he could have stopped it. Uh, well, he could have stopped it, but without undesirable consequences. Uh, and so I don't think that the monetary authority can control bubbles completely. My general idea is that they're part of living we're, not, we're going to have them again, but just we want to develop our markets and our information structure better, and I think that will reduce them. Yeah. Professor Schiller, I'm really excited to see you speak today. I get excited about seeing you the way some people might go to see Britney Spears concerts or <laughs> something like that. Like, uh, since well, I, thank you. Uh, since I read your book in 2000, the second edition of your Irrational Exuberance book in 2006, I've been showing the, the chart of mm -hmm. yours uh, to people and explaining that the chart's going to, you know, the curve will come back down to the, or rather, there's a good reason to think that the exponential uh, increase will come back down near some uh, other level, maybe near 110 or 120. And I want to ask you about two of the uh, counter, or two of the arguments that I most often hear. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say, well, that doesn't really, that chart doesn't have a way to take into account that a lot of houses have been remodeled and granite countertops and all sorts of 
uh, things have been put questionable, in. Uh, <laughs> Maybe questionable, but they... We have they, them, too, I know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm tired of them already. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there any way to know whether the, uh, the long-run position of where that line should be in real terms is around where it used to be or somewhere yeah. higher as a result of that? And the second uh, yeah. one is have yeah. tax rules, uh, have capital gains uh, write-offs for your... Uh, uh, capital gains exclusions on your, your, the home you live in uh, rules that came in in the 90s have these potentially affected people's propensity to make investments like granite countertops. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, as, as for biases in the index, I have to admit this index is not perfect. And uh, uh, it's different segments were done differently. So improvements are not <coughs> necessarily, there's both sides of it. There's depreciation and improvements. <coughs> and so it's, it's hard to, uh, uh, yeah. Over long periods of time, there could be some drift in it. But I think that at least looking at these indices, it suggests that uh, there's a popular misconception about the, the um, uh, appreciation of home. We did questionnaire surveys in Los Angeles and San Francisco. But I remember Los Angeles in 2004. We asked people, what do you think is the median price increase to expect per year over the next 10 years? And the median answer was 10% a year. Uh, now, people don't know what they're thinking. Uh, that chart shows virtually 0% until this recent boom. And uh, I can just, I don't even need this plot. I mean, the plot helps to see it. But uh, just think about what if Los Angeles home prices had gone up 10% a year for every year since 1890? Now, do you know what 1.1 <laughs> to the 130th power is? <laughs> I, I don't even know, but I hate to think. Uh, and the people have this imagination, uh, which, is, which is distorted. So at least the figure helps you see something. The other thing you're asking is about the capital gains tax, uh, which was changed in 1997. Uh, the, the, the new law, it used to be that, uh, I remember the details, you, you had a uh, one-time life uh, ex exclusion of 550,000, I don't remember exactly. And then they changed it so that you can, um, if you keep selling a house, uh, you can take the capital gain every time, and uh, it, it lo effectively lowers the capital gains tax on houses. And that did come in in 97, right at the beginning of the boom. But on the other hand, it didn't come in in other countries. And we see a lot of other countries with booms at the same time. So uh, that's the thing about economics. Usually there's more possible explanations than, than uh, there's data to. Uh, but it seems to me that it's probably uh, not the whole story. <laughs>